One question that I have sort of looming over this uh, presentation and also this entire day is uh, to what extent will this framework actually be enforced and complied with? Um, because, you know, the, there has always been a lot of data protection law out there. It used to be more diffuse in 28 uh, national member state uh, uh, laws. Now everything is in this uh, grand document with 99 provisions and 173 uh, recitals. Uh, and there appears to be a push towards more enforcement with the sanctions and a lot of the procedures, but as we see, it, it might not be fully baked. Do, do you really think that this will be enforced or will there be like the, uh, you know, oh, two cases against big American online companies, which is what we've seen so far already? If, yeah. I, if I can start, I think it will be enforced. Uh, I think even if it's not, per I mean, what legislation is perfect, so of course ev every piece of legislation is perfectable. I think it will be enforced, and I know from uh, my former colleagues within the Article 29 Working Party that everybody is getting ready for it, and by everybody I also include, uh, I mean, I especially refer here to supervisory authorities. Um, so also, I, I really wanted to mention this, uh, talking about opinions of advocate generals. There's actually an opinion of an advocate general issued uh, this September, on the 8th of September, in the case uh, concerning uh, right, uh, right to be forgotten request from an Italian citizen. I can enter a bit into details if you want. But uh, the advocate general actually refers in its last paragraph of the opinion to Article 17 of the GDPR already. So he says that, look, all this, uh, my entire uh, you know, argumentation is fully valid under Article 17 of Regulation 679 per 16, which is uh, the GDPR. So uh, I mean, we are one year and a half, more or less, before it becomes fully applicable, but we can already see how the soft, case, the soft case law of the Court of Justice, which is uh, comprised of these opinions of advocate generals, uh, fully refer to it. Let me just push back against that a little bit. So Oniko showed us the uh, uh, budgets of the, uh, uh, the three DPAs in uh, the Benelux area. So to be sure, not the biggest member states, but you know, the Netherlands has 17 million um, uh, people. Uh, uh, and I think the budget there was eight million, which is probably what you know uh, Google pays for gumballs in its gumball machine in uh, uh, one of the Mountain View offices. So right. well, I thought that maybe um, there will be a lot of uh, also variety to go back to the idea of federalism, or at least the idea of, of um, different geography in Europe. Uh, as in, uh, you see, also in Spain, there's so many different uh, authorities. Uh, that are in the same situation we see in Germany. So it would be, I think that there would be, I would agree that there would be more of an enforcement because the instruments are definitely there, but that would depend also on the region and the data protection authorities, their capacities in terms of also their financial capacities, but also their willingness uh, to enforce. So we will see also more of the same uneven picture. I would not uh, think that that would change significantly, but there's strongly, um, I mean, the, the at least the instruments are strongly enforced. So you would think that people would like to experiment with it. And we see at least that the Court of Justice in that area is very pushy, which is giving, giving also to the national courts um, uh, more fuel, so to speak. Uh, so we can see, I think, further developments, which again, I'm not sure whether there would be um, a certain differences between what we see in the private sector and in the uh, sort of law enforcement sector. Because this under Euro European law, at least uh, strictly speaking, um, not like in, in the US, there is a, some of these principles are the same. Uh, still there is, I mean, different legislation uh, that applies. Uh, but uh, I, I would think that maybe it would depend also on what the, uh, the extent to which the FTC's regulatory style is accepted by some of the DPAs. And maybe Felix can also um, talk about whether that's the case in Germany that uh, um, there, there is more willingness to look into um, strategic enforcement um, and not uh, the enforcement of individual uh, complaints in different fields. 
Um, no, the impetus for the uh, Schrems case was the uh, uh, national security apparatus access to data, which still remains outside the uh, remit of the Court of Justice of the EU. Is that going to be an ECHR thing? Should we expect to see European national security agencies challenged in the uh, ECHR, or will the ECJ step into the I void? mean, I, I would see that maybe a possibility would be just to, ch uh, to, ch to challenge the new privacy shield uh, in front of the ECJ. Um, That's easy, so but what about challenging the uh, national security activity in Europe? There, there are also cases pending before the Court of Human Rights. Certainly, there are cases against the UK pending there. Uh, so we will see how the Court of Human Rights will uh, react to that um, and how then the Court of Justice will take the bow maybe and, and also apply these principles. Uh, but um, I think that the first things first and that would be probably we, we can expect that the privacy shield would be challenged um, in terms Jules. of the national security context. You talked about the new ability to bring direct actions and class actions and NGOs. That's not typically, despite Pirate Party and so forth, it, it's not typically been the mass type of activity. How much do you think, just from you know the environment, how much do you think the Schrems case and the fact that, wait, someone can do this, there, there's another Schrems in the wings, but, but there isn't. Where is the other Schrems? So maybe Digital Rights Ireland, even Schrems now, it's like expensive. He's you know not like, hey, maybe someone else should, should do some of these right. cases. H have, has, this, has the culture changed? Is there like a tide now? where we're going to see much more consumer legal activity than we've seen before because of the public attention as well as the legal rights? Or, or is it still kind of just not the method of, of activism? I would, I would say, what was the expression used before that we don't like disruption? Who said that in Europe? You know? And I think it's, but this is really just based on my opinion. I don't have any data to, to you know, back this up. But I think we are still not at the point where we will see uh, a max rims, uh, at least one max rims in all, each member state, let's say. We are still not there. On another hand, I think uh, people started to be more aware of these issues. Uh, I've seen more activities from NGOs. Even uh, in Eastern Europe, which is not that famous for uh, you know, having strong uh, um, yeah, civil society. Um, but I, I think um, you know, hold our horses a bit because it's, uh, it's still um, not a general uh, movement, let's say. Biliana, what's your reaction? Here in the US, sometimes academics uh, it's a nice way to, you know, freelance and help write a brief and and so forth. It, it, do you see, you know, in your well, colleagues? We don't have like clinics in in European schools, so, uh, schools. So we don't have in European universities these kind of clinics that are here very often involved in this kind of uh, litigation. Uh, more it comes from the NGOs and there are issues of resources um, there. So um, the thing is that it. It just if one case is picked up and then it can become a precedent, it doesn't need that there is so much more activities um, from coming from the bottom up. So if just one shrimp is enough, I could say, um, then um, then we can see also more of a reaction. And now maybe he has inspired others to seek uh, more fame. Uh, one could say. Uh, so we will see. But um, in general, what puzzles me is that there is so much. Um, activity in this uh, area, uh, whereas not so much in other areas of European law. Uh, so I think that might have to do with the fact that uh, a lot of the interests of the member states are not directly affected here. It's uh, usually American companies that are affected. And so um, maybe we could see after with more media attention that there will be differences uh, in how the court interprets these provisions, and at least how it distinguishes between the security and the private sector. Uh, but um, yeah, so far. To, to stick for a moment with academics, um, even setting aside the uh, clinical work and litigation, uh, I think in the US it's pretty clear that a large part of the academic community has an activist or a privacy activist uh, uh, sort of twist. Um, and I think in Europe it's been very different traditionally. People sort of worked on the government side right. more. 
Uh, do you see that changing as you go to Maastricht? <laughs> maybe there's more work for, uh, there's, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe more work for us. Uh, certainly, a lot of people who come uh, like me from general European law background have been looking into that area because it's a, a new and exciting area of development where the court has been active and um, there is uh, interpretations of the charter that you have far-reaching effects. So um, that's inspiring more academics to look into that. But the uh, kind of interesting issue is that maybe um, in the US where you have more uh, or less regulation, you have more privacy scholarship. In Europe, we have more regulation and less of a privacy scholarship. So maybe that kind of there is some kind of a correlation.